expecting to travel tomorrow, the start of the bank holiday, but it's likely they'll be faced with similar delays and issues we've seen over the past few days. Emma Cole reporting there. Coming up in the next hour, it is, of course, Wednesday's edition of Cross Question. Joining me in the studio to take your calls will be, or are, Claire Pearsall, political commentator and Conservative councillor. She was a special advisor to the Immigration Minister, Caroline Noakes. Owen Jones, a Guardian columnist and author. Yasmin Sirhan, staff writer at The Atlantic. And Dr Anka Sahota, Labour London Assembly member for Ealing and Hillingdon. He chairs the London Assembly Health Committee and also is a working GP multitasking writ large there 0345 6060973 is the number to call if you'd like to put a question to our panel and you can of course watch us on Global Player On your radio on Global Player and Play LBC Leading Britain's conversation This is LBC From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock. The Transport Secretary has told airlines to stop selling tickets for flights they cannot staff. Grant Shapps is understood to be meeting aviation leaders this afternoon, insisting this week's disruption cannot be repeated. The government insists it's played its part, but is being accused of shifting the blame. Travel editor of The Independent, Simon Calder, told LBC the sector is guilty of being overly optimistic once restrictions were lifted. There is a certain optimism bias in travel. It's the industry of human happiness. And so... Uh, maybe they thought, well, if everything goes absolutely fine, then we'll be all right. But of course, the first law of um, aviation is that things never go completely according to plan. And as we've seen, stuff has been unravelling. Jurors are about to give their verdict in Johnny Depp's multi-million dollar lawsuit against his ex-wife Amber Heard. The actor sued his former partner for $50 million after she wrote an article in which she claimed to be a victim of domestic abuse. Boris Johnson says he was very, very surprised when he received a fine for attending a party during lockdown. The Prime Minister says the gatherings in Downing Street were needed to keep morale high. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down 74 points at 75.32. The pound buys $1.24 and €1.17. LBC weather, a dry and clear night for all, lows of five. Cloudy with spells of rain in Northern Ireland tomorrow, drier elsewhere with sunny spells and the odd shower and a high of 19 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Lottie Morley. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross-question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's two minutes past eight. Welcome to Wednesday's Cross Question. I'm Ian Dale. On the panel with me tonight, Claire Pearsall, political commentator, Conservative councillor, former special advisor to the Immigration Minister, Caroline Noakes. Owen Jones, Guardian columnist and author. Yasmin Sirhan is a staff writer at The Atlantic. And Dr Onka Sahota is Labour London Assembly member for Ealing and Hillingdon. And he chairs the London Assembly. He's not chairman of the Health Committee, as I just said a moment ago, but he was for eight years, so we can be forgiven I suppose and he's also a working GP. We're looking forward to your calls 0345 6060 973 and don't forget to watch us on Global Player Call 0345 6060 973 Tweet at LBC Text 84850 Cross Question with Ian Dale This is LBC well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first caller. It's Vicky in Hounslow. Hi, Vicky. Hi, evening, Ian, and hi, evening, panel. Hi. Uh, hi. hi. So, um, I just had a question as far as how our government's able to say they're democratic or patriotic when the votes on our NHS's health services reduced from um, the borough to a national uh, level, a uh, local level, and um, such as reducing the ability for someone with a learning difficulty to even be told that they had been enforced with a DNR. Just run that by me again. I'm not quite clear what the question is there. So uh, when the government had reduced the ability for the boroughs to vote on the health services that were um, available to them, it was reduced from the boroughs down to like a regional level. Um, they also enforced DNRs onto people who had severe learning difficulties without consulting them or their legal guardians. 
just to explain, I, I, I'm still not with you. Well, when you say voting at borough level to regional level, I, I don't really understand what that means. So with the um, Health and Wellbeing uh, Board, the healthcare board, they actually had for um, the NHS Health Services the ability to vote on what was needed in, um, based on the needs of their boroughs and the people who would um, attend surgeries, letting them know, like the GPs who were attending the um, meetings that, regarding their, their healthcare uh, needs in their boroughs. They were able to vote on the things that were needed for the NHS, and um, that was over 120 odd votes reduced down to nine because it would then went into a regional sector um, vote. So um, that was that was how it used to be that we would have votes um, by borough as opposed to regional, say like the north. But borough east councils do, do not con- borough councils do not control the NHS in any shape or form. I'm still not clear about. Well, Anka, let's come to you on this. Do you understand what Vicky's saying? I'm, Vicky could very well be saying that the Health and Wellbeing Board is a local authority board which scrutinise the work of the NHS in the area, OK? Um, but, of course, the the delivery of NH, NHS is through NHS itself, but it's been delegated to the uh, CCGs uh, and acting through the PCN, which are the local networks. So things have, have changed, and the scrutiny of the uh, of the NHS by the, uh, uh, by the local authority has also been diminished, right, because of the fact that they, they, just, um, that they have little less say on it. But I think that's what maybe is happening. But but you're right, of course, is that uh, we need to make sure health services are responsive to the needs of local population. And the endeavour is that uh, that the PCNs should be consulting the local populations to do that. I, I, that may be what Vicky's meaning. Because there used to be regional health boards, didn't they? But they, they went, I think, under Tony Blair. Yes, uh, we, we, we've had a lot of re- reorganisation in NHS and I've been a GP now for, for 35 years and it's a reorganisation... You're all looking well on it. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know what medicine to take. <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, but, but, but but that's what's happened. So we're going through a cycle again. Right? You're right, we had, we had health boards, we had three borough uh, health boards linking together, then we had CCGs, now we have PCs, and now we're getting what's called integer, integrated care organisations. So re- re- reformulating what, what we disbanded. So do do you think, I mean, I think Vicky probably means that there needs to be more local democratic input into the running of the health service. But on the other hand, how do you, if you have a health service management at a local level, there's got to be a certain trust that they know what they're doing, hasn't there? There is, a, I think, in terms of of health of health delivery, there's the, they don't make those sort of decisions, right? But about what the treatment is, right? Because that's all done by the national bodies, right? And, and evidence based. But I think what is happening is the is what's required locally. Okay, yeah. when you re- reconfigure services, or when you close hospitals, or when you close. I mean, my own particular career started in 2011 when they wanted to close four ANEs in West London. I remember and, that. And closing 1,000 beds, right? Yeah. Um, that's what brought me into politics, right? That, that we need to have local accountability. And aren't you glad, right, that I won that uh, campaign? I'm because, absolutely delighted. Because <laughs> had the COVID had the COVID happened, we lost one of those thousand beds, and those four ANEs were closed. We would have been a much worse place than we already. Don't get me started on cuts in hospital beds, but um, that, that's an entirely different subject. Claire, what do you reckon to this? Should there be more local democratic input into NHS management? I think it depends what local level you're talking about. Um, health decisions are taken at a county level. I sit on a district council, so we we have no sort of oversight of it. I would quite like to have some oversight of it because my village has a... politician wants more power. Obviously. <laughs> who wouldn't? Um, but my local GP surgery is struggling, and I would quite like to have some input. I have none, and I would quite like to uh, put my points across to them. But it... it you start to get messy if you say at a local level each village each town each city will have areas where people will want to say on the matter and i think you can just go too far and it becomes too complicated we need a structure i'm not necessarily sure the ccg structure works and we'll see what the next reiteration of that becomes but local people are very invested So I do believe that they should have an input, but not necessarily at the sort of minute level of each village, for example. Uh, Yasmin. Oh, gosh. Well, as the American on the panel, I I must say it is even just refreshing to kind of just hear about nationalized healthcare in a debate over at what level it should be. (laughs) It should be offered. Um, But yeah, I can't. I mean, I... 
I can't say I know too much about the sort of, especially to the extent that my, my fellow panelists do about sort of how the NHS is run and where the decision levels are made. I mean, I think what I will say is, is just an aside is that when I first moved here in 2017, the, the most difficult thing that I did was create um, a bank account. The easiest thing I did was register with a GP surgery. Mm. Um, and I've actually found that my own experience, even though I live in Hackney and, you know, the, the I think the, the GPs around there are, they have quite a lot of people, but I've always kind of had such a good experience. That isn't to downplay what Vicky is saying about their being receptive to, to what, you know, local people need. And especially what to the point that she had made about kind of those with special needs and, and making sure there's an outlet for those voices to be heard, I think is is very important. Um, but yeah, just the, the first thing that came to mind was, oh, I'd love to see this at home. <laughs> <laughs> Owen? Well, I mean, the clinical commissioning group model was introduced, obviously, in the top-down reorganisation by Andrew Lansley. It was at 2013, and that was... The legislation was three times longer than the original piece of legislation that introduced the National Health Service, which just, I think, illustrates the level of complexity, the mess that I think people at the time argued that it, it would be. Because it, what it did is it fragmented what, of course, is the National Health Service, and it really undermined the N in the National Health Service. I'm not just going to lay the blame on the Tories. New Labour you know, their idea of reform, when we talk about healthcare reform, was often associated with not, which I think is a good thing, in, in you know, increasing the involvement of patients of local communities in healthcare, but introducing market forces. Anyone who knows the basics about a market knows there's winners and there's losers, but also creeping private sector involvement. That was accelerated under the the Conservative Lib Dem coalition and the Conservatives, but you know, New Labour have their Actually own. Actually, went up more under New Labour than it did under the coalition. Well, it, again, I mean, it was starting from a lower level, but yeah, you're, you're right. They both have. I'm not going to defend New Labour's record. I think it was good they increased the investment in the National Health Service. That should be defended, and naturally, that investment paid off um, under New Labour. But it undermined the model and accountability because, by definition, private companies are not accountable to local communities and local patients. They're accountable to shareholders and those who make money. And that's, in my view, a, a conflict with service users. Now, the NHS as a whole hasn't been privatised, but it has been fragmented and undermined. I think we should focus on ways of involving patients and local communities rather than private companies. But haven't we got a fundamental dilemma here? Because if it's a national health service, and we're talking about introducing democracy at a local level, inevitably that will mean that in one part of the country, you have a service level that's very different from another. I mean, we have that all, already. But if you, if you introduce more localism into the NHS, it, it becomes less of an NHS, Well, I think, doesn't it? I mean, obviously there's certain decisions that have to be taken at a national level, wherever, because you can't have a postcode, we do have a postcode lottery, but we want to minimise the postcode lottery. Everyone should expect an excellent level of service wherever they live. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. There are places where you are better off being a cancer patient than others, for example. Obviously, we need to level the... Obviously, there are, some communities have greater health needs than others. A poorer community will have higher levels of maybe heart disease, of obesity, of, of various mental health issues. So actually, you know, if you're going to tailor a service for a local community, then it makes sense to involve local communities because every community is different. There will be a different demographic makeup. So, you know, I'm not, as someone on the left, I do support public ownership, but I think it's a mistake to think it should just be top down with bureaucrats in Whitehall running something. I think you can have publicly run services that are locally accountable, not least because every community is different and every community has a different health. I mean, take just quickly, there were Kensington's in Chelsea, the average um, life expectancy there is something like 15 years higher than the poorest. So obviously there are different needs which mm. a health service needs to be responsive to. Let's go back to this issue of beds, which is a bit of a hobby horse of mine, because if you go back to 1980 and look at the number of hospital beds that there were in England in particular, I think it was something like nearly 200,000, and it's now down to under 100,000. This has happened under successive governments, and I don't believe that any health secretary decided, oh, let's cut beds. It will have been people within the NHS structure that decided, well, actually, we want to move away from having people in hospital. We want to treat them at home or in the community or whatever. Now, during the pandemic, we... we found out that that was not necessarily the best way. And when you compare us with other European countries, we have far fewer beds. Now, I suspect that if there had been local account more local accountability, that might have not gone through in the way that it did. So that would be an advantage of having much more local political accountability on COVID. 
Well, well, look, certainly, uh, I think people are very, very affectionate towards their health services and their hospitals particularly. And I certainly know that we, as you, as you already have alluded to the fact, that we have the lowest ratio of hospital beds to the population, the lowest ratio of doctors to the population, the lowest ratio of nurses to, 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 patient, to population in the OECD countries. And one of the things we did in London was to get an independent report prepared by the King's Fund, who have, who have said we need 1,600 well, more beds. Health equivalent of the IFS, they must never be questioned. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is evidence-based. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, and, and that we, we need to have 1,600 more beds. So I think we need more beds. Okay? And, and I think we, the other cool thing I want to talk about, is, is which uh, owners talk, talk about, is that one of the things the, the Tory, sorry, the Labour government did under Blair is that they broke the link between a number of population to doctors doctors. Beforehand, uh, there was a committee called the Medical Services Committee, which appointed a number of doctors to any given area linked to the population there. Now what happens, you're not registered with, with a doctor, you're registered with a practice. And that's what's allowed the, the, the private sector to move in, all the, all the health service providers. That's what's allowed that, that happen. And now what we've got right is a disproportionate d- d- dissociation between the number of doctors in the system and the population. And, and I think that's a bad thing. We need to go back to the system where we link the population to the number of doctors uh, in the system, and that was a bad thing we did. Uh, Vicky, thank you very much for that question. Uh, we'll move on in just a moment to something completely different. 0345 6060 973 if you'd like to put a question to our panel. We are expecting the verdict in the Amber Heard Johnny Depp uh, case in the next half an hour, so we'll bring that to you when we get it if that's something you're particularly interested in. It's quarter past eight. This is LBC. <laughs> Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 
It's 90 minutes past eight on LBC. You're listening to or watching Cross Question. Claire Pearsall is here, political commentator and Conservative councillor. Owen Jones, Guardian columnist and author. Hasn't got a book to plug at the moment, but he's writing a new one, or, or nearly writing a new I'm one. I'm going to get that Ian Stop, I'll get PTSD. <laughs> Yasmin Serhan is a staff writer at The Atlantic. For those of our listeners who don't know what The Atlantic is, what is it? It's an American magazine. Um, it was founded in 1857, I believe. So we're, we've been around for a while, but it's kind of one of the world's, in my opinion, I think they're one of the world's premier magazines for politics, tech, science, health, culture. And it's become quite big here now, hasn't it? You've, got, you've recruited quite a lot of British political journalists too. We did, yeah. Tom McTagg, Helen Lewis. One of um, my authors when I was a publisher. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, um, yeah, they, we, we decided, given our name, we should tackle both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. So, yeah, we opened our bureau in 2017 and been going strong since. And we have Dr. Onka Sahota with us. He, I'm calling him the Speaker of the London <laughs> Assembly, but he's actually the Chairman, ch Chair of the London Assembly, and he's the member for Ealing and Hillingdon. Right, let's go to Ben in Clacton. Hello, Ben. Hello, Ian. Um, hello, panel. Um, it's a royal question. Um, Prince William was reported in the Daily Mail and the uh, Mirror uh, about his idea when the Duchy of Cornwall passes to him as a prin Prince of Wales, um, he will try and let some of the properties out to home the homeless. Do do the panel think this is a good idea? So uh, I actually thought you were going to say that the the royal palaces should be um, made over to homeless people, which I mean some people certainly believe that they should. Um, Claire, let's start with you. I think this is kind of a noble idea, but what concerns me is whose responsibility will it fall to? Does that mean that the royal family let out Frogmore Cottage in Windsor for argument's sake? Do they then become the landlord of that? Or does that fall to the local council, which then has the duty of care, has to go in and make sure everything is right, as they should, but it's another property to take on and it's more expensive. Is that the one that Harry and Meghan... It might, it might be. And don't live be. there anymore. That's the one. That's the one. Um, so I would just be concerned as to who picks up the tab for this. So I, these things are all very noble and it's a very good idea, but the practicalities are quite difficult. You need well, to understand the list. the Duchy of the Cornwall, list. presumably, the Duchy of Cornwall controls it all. And but they, they but would pick will up. it? So they would become a landlord? Yeah, well, they are a landlord anyway. I mean, they... they, they, they but not quite what, What's, to what's that village near Dorchester that... Um, is supp supposedly that Prin the Prince Charles, I think, helped design, and it was meant to be a model for the future. Oh yeah, I've been there. I stayed there. It's, I stayed it's there a, a few it's months a ago for a wedding. Weird place, really, really it? odd. I went there for a wedding, but I wouldn't. I don't want to denigrate the community that people obviously are very fond of, but very odd. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit Swiss, isn't it? So lots of control over what you can paint. Yeah, his taste in architecture is, sort of is appalling. Let's just be <laughs> really honest about it. It's terrible. I wish I could remember what it was called. Somebody, somebody. I, I stayed there. I went there in August. Somebody texted me and told me what, what <laughs> so it's it wasn't called. even that long ago. No, can't it was remember. really recent. It was, like, um, it was a big I mean, wedding. Yes, yeah, I mean, on the face of it, this seems like a bit of a no-brainer. If you if you're a very rich institution like the Duchy of Cornwall, why wouldn't you do something like this? Yeah, I mean, if he's offering, um, I think, you know, I remember during the pandemic, I did some reporting about um, a piece looking at sort of the British government's pretty incredible effort to take sort of the unhoused population in Britain and put them in hotels for their own safety so they could have, you know, a, a, you know, a place to, to, to eat and drink and sleep. Um, and it was this incredible effort because overnight, seemingly, just, you know, Lond in particularly London's homeless problem, this was, you know, I think seen around the country, just kind of temporarily disappeared. Um, I remember speaking to kind of folks in the community who worked with these populations um, who really helped them. And it strikes me that that would be the sort of perfect person. In fact, I, I, um, I remember this one woman, Lorraine, telling me, you know, if I could just get a hotel that I could run myself and help bring people in, make sure they have the resources they need, help, and then you, you know, in the lobby, there would be various charities there to help them, you know, with information on how to open a bank account, how to get access to jobs, you know, anything they need really, sort of the really rudimentary, having all of that in one place. Now, I think it's perhaps a better investment to invest in sort of hotel-like sort of accommodation like that. And I think to an extent, some of these things exist, but of course they're in short supply. They're not always, you know, it's not always easy to get access to them. Um, sometimes, depending on where people are, they don't necessarily want to have to leave where they currently are residing to go to these places because then they feel ostracized even further. So, um, 
you know, if, if they're willing to perhaps give up the property to some to some community leaders who know how to do this work the best, or at least have input from them, then of course, why not? Um, perhaps no. sell it and then buy a load of buildings that can provide that purpose. I don't no, know. Owen, the place that you can't remember because you got so drunk at the wedding is called Poundbury. It was, it was, I was, <laughs> it was Poundbury. No, I was going to protest, but I was pretty inebriated. <laughs> <laughs> so, the answer to the um, question. I'm uncomfortable with this. I don't like relying on the generosity of the rich to deal with social problems in society. Um, the biographer of Clement Attlee once summed up the approach of the post-war Labour government is, if a rich man wants to help the poor, then he should pay his taxes gladly, not dole out money at a whim. And obviously this is not money, but it's something in kind. Um, we've got a massive housing crisis in this country. Rough sleeping is the most extreme edge of it. It's gone up since 2010 quite steeply, but there are also huge numbers of families in bed and breakfast, for example. There are huge numbers of families in overcrowded homes. And there are also lots of homes in this country which are left empty, including in London, not just, we're talking about huge, vast royal properties, um, but also, well, you know, there was an occupation of Russian oligarchs' empty mansion. I would start by taking, uh, confiscating Russian um, oligarchs' mansions and giving them to homeless people. I suggested that um, a few months ago, and I still stand by that. I think that, that would be a good way of doing it. And I think, actually, councils do actually have the power to... Um, to sequestrate, to, to confiscate properties that are left derelict and abandoned for, or empty for long periods mm. of time. I think it's a social crime to own property which you leave empty when there are huge numbers of people in the midst of a housing crisis, including rough sleepers. So I would be more comfortable with saying if homes, including those owned by very rich people, e.g. Russian oligarchs, but not just them, are left empty for long periods of time, then council should take them over and house homeless people in them. We have the breaking news that... Mm. What, what's happened? Huge drum roll. No, the 54 letters haven't been reached. Uh, <laughs> Johnny Depp has won the libel trial against Amber Heard. Uh, we're going to speak to a reporter with the full details very shortly. I don't know if any of you are particular... Actually, I've got quite a bit of reaction from you on that. Do we want to quickly, before we come to your answer um, on, on our question on homeless people, then should we... Should we just, do you want to comment on that? Because I, I thought he would win, I must admit. Yeah, yeah, so did I, mean, I. I haven't followed it very closely, but from what I have followed, I thought, I think he's going to win this. Yeah, I think he I think he did. I think um, Amber Heard has not come off very well. The ultimate winners here are the lawyers. Yeah. I really think that they could have done this without all of this court attention. But, uh, no, I did think he'd win, and I'm, I, you know, I'm pleased for what it's worth. My opinion on this for what it's worth. Okay. I haven't been following it in detail, so I, I, I don't think I, I'm, I'm knowledgeable enough to comment on that. But I'm glad that the that the jury has come to the decision, right? And has ended the saga. Yeah, which I we, think we, we can all agree on that, Yasmin. I conducted a inadvertently conducted a bit of a social experiment where I went out of my way to not engage with this trial in any way. And um, and we were talking about this just before, but I was actually kind of surprised that I could not avoid this trial if I tried. And when I did engage with it, particularly like on TikTok, Instagram, things like that, it was constantly pushed at me. And it was a very pro dep narrative. Now, as someone who didn't follow it, with no disrespect to the people involved, I just like Amber Heard just came off really poorly and Depp came off really positively. So that I was a little suspicious as to why that was the case, but, you know, it's not surprising then as a result. All I say is obviously defer to the jury, and I, I was expecting this result myself. My only worry is, I mean, this was clearly a very toxic relationship, objectively. They were both two people who should not have been together. <laughs> we can see how that, based on how it's ended. All I, I would say is, uh, I hope the coverage of Amber Heard doesn't lead to women coming forward in a country like Britain, for example, 1.4 million women face domestic violence a year at the hands of men, and often they sustain domestic violence, where the legacy of this trial isn't the disbelief of women who come forward, because the reality is there are huge numbers of women who are abused by their partners, one to two women are killed a week by their former or current partners, and we need more women to be able to come forward. This is obviously the verdict. The jury have seen the evidence, I haven't, and I understand, I saw, I, I thought the evidence was pointing in that direction, but let's not end in a situation where women aren't believed mm. in because most don't come forward because they feel they won't be believed. My final word on this would be to say that I, I think the judge should have struck it out right from the start because clearly there were two people who were in a toxic relationship and um, mm. he should have just said, sort it out between yourselves. Mm. But that's not how the justice system works, I think, not just in America, but here as well. Um, let's go back to our question from Ben in Clacton. Do the panel think we could use some royal property to house the homeless and so on? Onka. Well, uh, I think Prince William 
reflecting on his future uh, as we celebrate the Jubilee Platinum is a very appropriate moment for him to do so, to think uh, what can the royal family do for society uh, when we reflect on what great job his grandmother's done. And, and, and I think coming across this idea is a noble idea, but I think we need to do more than that than just give one property over. Uh, I, think, I, think I don't think he was suggesting just one. OK, well, well he will need to do, <laughs> do a bit more than that, OK. Uh, but certainly, uh, I, I think that this is a noble idea and, and it does... Put, the, 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 we have, we have a health, uh, we have a problem with the with the homeless, and certainly we resolved it during the COVID pandemic, right, when we were yeah. able to take all people off. One other thing is that we, which we have is that tuberculosis, uh, TB rates in London uh, or anywhere in the country are a measure of social deprivation. And if we get people who are homeless, who who are who are who are TB, set up a hostel for them that we can give them a treatment for for those nine months or twelve months. That we start, I think, a, a royal palace for people suffering with tuberculosis, and let's get them treated well on the streets. Well, you know, Frogmore Cottage, I'm sure Harry and Meghan will approve. Uh, we'll come to more of your calls in just a moment. 0345 973 Ben, thank you for your call. Let's get the latest news headlines at 8.30 with Lottie Morley. A jury has found Amber Heard defamed Johnny Depp when she wrote an article in the Washington Post in which she claimed to be a victim of domestic abuse. The actor has been awarded $15 million in damages. A jury has charged the white 18-year-old accused of shooting 10 black people at a supermarket in Buffalo with domestic terrorism and 10 counts of first-degree murder. Payton Gendron, who has been in custody since the shooting on May the 14th, is due in court on Thursday. And Boris Johnson says he was very, very very surprised when he received a fine for breaking lockdown rules in Downing Street. The Prime Minister says refusing to resign is the responsible approach due to the war in Ukraine and cost of living crisis. LBC weather, a dry and clear night for all and a low of five degrees. This is LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 8.33 on LBC. Claire Pearsall, Owen Jones, Yasmin Sirhan and Dr Onkar Sahota with us answering your calls. Let's go to Anthony and Staines. Hello, Anthony. Oh, yes, good evening, uh, Ian and panel. Hi. And um, talking about verdicts, um, if Boris Johnson does face the 1922 committee and maybe he wins it, should he call an immediate general election? Well, if he, if he wins the vote of confidence, should he yeah. then call it... What, why would he do that? Well, to clear the air, to reassert his power. Well, he, he would have won the vote, so why does he need to reassert anything? Well, yes, because then he, like Theresa May, she won, but she continued to face that backbiting, which brought her down. You know, that's the mistake I feel that she made. OK, well, it's a thought. Owen Jones. Yeah, fine. I mean, I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, sure. I think he should definitely do that. I think that would not be a good idea for him because... For one thing, not just Partygate, where him and his aides systematically broke the law while people couldn't hold the hands of their dying relatives and watch their relatives buried on Zoom. Um, not just that, not the people. He, in charge of communicating the rules and setting the laws, which he apparently didn't understand. I saw he, one of his apologists on your show saying, oh, well, and people didn't read the rules. How could they... He's the Prime Minister of the country. Pull yourself together. Lord Moylan, you're Indeed. About, yes. Ridiculous. L- it, ridiculous It, it didn't defense. get a great reaction that bit on social did media. It not? Did it not? No. Really? How odd. People, <laughs> apparently the incompetence of the Prime Minister is now his defence. It's not just that. It's not just that. There's the fact we're living through a cost of living crisis in which people already before they suffered the longest squeezing wages since Emperor Napoleon died. The fact that obviously huge numbers of people have been driven into hardship and insecurity. And given the divisions within the Conservatives, I think it would be an extremely bold move. Theresa May, in far more favourable circumstances, when she was 24 points ahead of the Labour Party, called a snap general election and lost her majority. I think calling a snap general election, given the crisis that's engulfed the Prime Minister, given in large parts of the country is less popular than cholera and given the squeeze in people's living standards, I would say absolutely bring it on whatever my problems with Labour and Keir Starmer, um, I would obviously infinitely prefer uh, a Labour government, uh, however awfully flawed I think it would be than the current lot so yeah fine, let's have a general election and then I think the Tories would currently lose if, if in the constituency that you live in there was a Conservative, Lib Dem, Labour and a socialist candidate, who would you support? Uh, I'm a Labour guy. I mean, it's it's you know my my relatives would turn in my in turn in their grave probably if I didn't support the Labour Party. I, look, I think you know Keir Starmer, to say the least, isn't my preferred. Uh, you know, I don't. You've I kind of burnt your boats with him, haven't you? Well, I mean, I'm an independent commentator. I'm not here to have to have boats uh, with the Labour leader or to share boats with the Labour leadership. I always say what I think. Um, and my view is Keir Starmer obviously won the Labour leadership on a series of promises he he then betrayed. But nonetheless, do I, you know, the difference between... My issue is the difference between a Labour government and a Conservative government has been made too small. But so many people live in that gap. You know, people who depend on universal credit, people who depend uh, on, you know, on on having the housing crisis dealt with, people who need an NHS that can cope. I don't think Labour will go far enough to deal with those crises, but they'll do something. Okay, Yasmin. Yeah, I mean, just thinking back to the last time there was potentially a a no-confidence vote with Theresa May, and she survived that, right? But she wasn't particularly strong after. That said, I I think I kind of agree with Owen in that I don't think... I I think if, if, if the Prime Minister thinks that he's facing a tough crowd with the MPs in his own party, I think given the situation he's facing currently, not just with Partygate, but with the cost of living, with the energy crisis, everything going on at the moment, I don't necessarily know that he's going to find much of a better reception among the general public. Also, I mean, when when the question was read out, my instinct was to quote that that wonderful woman, not another one. Yeah, I mean, Brenda. Uh, yeah, Brenda. Very good impression. Though. Thank you. Um, I, um, I mean, it's not like an election happened that long ago, but I just don't know if that is the answer, especially right now. I think the ter- if there were an election now, I wonder what the turnout would be, because I think there'd be a lot of Conservative voters that would actually stay at home and possibly people who are on your side of the Labour argument think, well, OK, I, I, I want to vote Labour, but I just can't while he's leader. Claire? 
It, no, please. Uh, no, I can't go through yet another election. I've been through that many in the past few years that I can't quite take it at the moment. I think that it would be a really bad move. The Conservatives would definitely drop their majority. I don't think Labour is strong enough either to get a majority. So then we're looking at another hung parliament. We're looking at a cobbled That'd together... Really a cobbled together kind of coalition of Labour and some others. Right. Really, I don't think that that's going to work and the policies that Labour don't seem to have are not going to come through, are they? Because it's a confused message that Keir Starmer's giving us as to what it is he does stand for. So the country is going to look well, at it and go... Whatever it is, Owen doesn't like it. Well, I, d I don't well, think Keir Starmer knows, but uh, there isn't... But that's I mean, my point. Labour don't have a vision, but I prefer a government... I mean, that Boris Johnson doesn't have a vision for the country either, but he's still doing some extremely toxic things. I'd take a Labour government without a vision than a Conservative government without a vision. That just does terrible things. OK. Well, look, uh, I, I think the, the, the issue isn't about um, the, 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 that it should be held election or not, but the issue really is that, that, that the Prime Minister has done something very, very wrong and people don't understand it. And if the Tory MPs want to um, keep him in office, they're going to be held accountable whether they, they hold election now or they hold election next year or the year after, we are going to hold them to account. But the important thing is, if he survives this no-confidence vote, then is what, by what margin does he survive in? Because if he, if he just makes it by a few votes, he's a weakened Prime Minister. It'd be uh, hilarious if it's 52-48. <laughs> <laughs> Prime Minister, right? He couldn't, couldn't carry on, right? And look, the, the, the question is that this, is, this country deserves better, right? Okay? We, have, we have bigger issues, but we can't have a Prime Minister who can't be trusted, who's a light to the who's lied repeatedly right, and who's above the law. Let's bring in a, a, another caller on a, on a similar subject here, but I think it's quite it's quite an interesting one. Martin is in Doncaster. Hello, Martin. Hi, Owen. Can I just say something quickly? I found out cool. my daughter's having a baby boy today and it's my first grandchild. Oh, oh bless her. Congratulations. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. And I, th and I thought your time was too long on Newsnight last night, Ian. <laughs> it was a bit, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah you're absolutely Ian. right. Um, yeah. It's a sartorial catastrophe. <laughs> my question was, sh should we seek to forgive Boris Johnson and Prince Andrew? And that's to the panel. Thank you. OK, I'm just reminded, Owen, that you wore a woman's blouse on Question Time. First time. So I, that's the last time I take sartorial advice from I did, you. It was an accident. I was re first time on Question Time, very excited. My friend said, sh go and I left a shirt for you. Went on. It went really well, obviously, the lucky shirt. And then he said, you didn't take my shirt at all. I said, what do you mean? He said, you took my girlfriend's blouse. <laughs> <Superb>. <laughs> We've all done it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, should we forgive Boris Johnson and Prince Andrew? Now, the Archbishop of Canterbury today has suggested that we should all find it in a hearts to forgive Prince Andrew and by complete coincidence I interviewed Sarah Ferguson the Duchess of York this morning but more of that anon. Uh, Yasmin. Gosh uh, two very big questions um, I mean I'll start with Boris Johnson because I, I think weirdly that's easier. Um, look I, I think it's up to, to the British people in terms of you know what they decide is is forgivable and I mean I, I think it's it's a difficult ask um, I think perhaps, and to the extent he's done this, I know he's apologised, but but I think what the Prime Minister should probably be doing is asking forgiveness. But I mean, it, the people... I don't he doesn't think, think he's done anything wrong, though, does he? I was going to say, I don't think the public necessarily, like, as it relates to their relationship with their Prime Minister, it's not about forgiveness or not. I think it's confidence. And ultimately, the question and is, trust. do they have confidence and trust? Right. I mean, forgiveness is something that you perhaps give to a loved one or a friend. Um, this The relationship between the public and the prime minister is, is yeah, principally one of trust. So um, I, I don't necessarily know if, if it's about forgiving Boris Johnson, but really a question of, do you trust Boris Johnson? Do you have faith that he's going to represent you to the extent and that's Prince required? Prince Andrew? Oh, gosh. I, I just think... Yeah, I'm gonna no. <laughs> I just I don't know. I yeah, I, I just that's uh, someone who the extent to which I pay attention to the monarchy really just starts and ends at the Queen, um, Prince Andrew. I think what he's been accused of is quite grim, and I don't, you know, if, if people. Yeah, I'm just gonna say no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nothing else. I mean, to what say. do you think has motivated the Archbishop of Canterbury to say this? Well, I mean, look on a spiritual level. Obviously, I know Christians. You know, forgiveness is very much part of the Christian faith. I, I, I get I get all that. And I think that's up to him and people of faith. I'm not someone of faith. I respect people who have faith. Um, whether they forgive people, you know, lot, lots of people uh, forgive, 
you know, the most heinous of crimes, people whose relatives have been killed by murderers and then they bring it upon themselves to forgive them and that's part of their healing process. So, you know, it's up to individuals to do that, but that shouldn't detract from accountability. Mm. You can forgive someone on a spiritual level but still think they should be held accountable for what they have done. And, you know, Boris Johnson obviously has systematic... Well, him and his staff systematically broke uh, laws that millions of people abided by at huge cost and sacrifice. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the, when we talk about... Prince Andrew, um, we're talking about someone who associated with a paedophile um, and obviously has reached a settlement with someone he allegedly never met for $12 million uh, or whatever it is. And I don't think he's, you know, I don't think either have had any accountability. That He's still the Prime Minister. When, look, homeless people were charged in the pandemic. Children were fined. And you can say, well, Boris Johnson was fined, but fines are punishments for the poor. Because obviously, if you're skint, then 50 quid's a lot of money. If you're the Prime Minister, it's nothing. So he's not had any accountability. And that sends a lesson to, to the country, which is pretty dire, which we already knew, I'm afraid, which is that, you know, that, that, that the, the, the state, justice, will crash down far harder on the poor than the rich. So if people want to spiritually forgive Boris Johnson, that's up to them. I'm not going to forgive him for what I think he's done to the country, let alone how he's behaved personally. But as for the, you know, this monarch, you know, Prince, and Prince Andrew is going to be rolled out for the Jubilee. And again, I do actually, despite supporting an elected head of state, have a lot of respect for the Queen. Like I think most people in this country do. But what is she thinking? Allowing this guy to come out and sully her celebrations that I'm not going to be out there. Well, he's going to be on the balcony, is Well, I mean, he's going to have some part, isn't he? And he should just be driven, you know, he should accept no role of any description in public life. He's still going to be a very rich guy. He's going to live a life of privilege. There's no human right to have uh, a public role in the way he still has, even though he's been stripped back. And my view is both need accountability. Forgive in your own time, if that's your belief, um, and you believe in forgiveness um, on that level, but both need accountability because the powerful don't get accountability in this country. Accountability exists for the, for the little guy. Well, I'm, I'm going to give Onka and Claire a couple of minutes to think about their answer because the Archbishop of Canterbury has slightly rowed back on his comments. He's, uh, <laughs> he, this is the statement here. The Archbishop of Canterbury has clarified comments he made about Prince Andrew seeking to make amends after he settled his sex abuse case out of court. A spokesperson for the Archbishop later clarified that he was not referring specifically to the Duke when he said we must become a more forgiving society, adding he was making a broader point about the kind of society that he hopes the Platinum Jubilee inspires us to be. Well, that's cleared that up, hasn't it? <laughs> or possibly not. We'll find out in a moment. 8.46. This is LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. It's 849. Claire Purcell, Owen Jones, Yasmin Sirhan and Onka Sahota with us answering your calls. Now, we were in the middle of us answering this question about forgiveness. Should we forgive Boris Johnson and Prince Andrew? Claire. Uh, no and no. And I think it actually relates back to something that Owen said. Uh, neither of them appear to be particularly sorry for no. what they've done. There have been no consequences well, laid Prince either. Andrew says he hasn't done anything. So well, so does Boris not. Johnson. <laughs> he, well, <laughs> you know, they've both used the same excuse that they've actually done nothing wrong. And I think we can see that both of them actually have. And there aren't any consequences. And it it is about integrity. Neither of them appear to have any integrity. It always seems to be someone else's problem. It seems to be someone else's fault. So Boris Johnson has gone into the House of Commons to say that he's really very sorry. But, and it's always that but, which is something that you get from a child. And I I just find this really annoying that we can have this, oh, I'm sorry, but I didn't understand, or I didn't mean to, etc. So, no, the, the flat answer to this is no, we shouldn't forgive them. And I'll stick with that. Okay. I think I, I agree with the, the consensus opinion on the panel here. Look, forgiveness does require recognition of the person who, who's done the wrong, that I've done something wrong and I want to be forgiven. And both of these haven't come to that thing. And the other thing about for, for, for forgiveness, of course, is that um, uh, is, is that um, the, 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 the person who, who's, who's done the offence should, should recognise but but also that forgiveness is, is a healing process for one's own individual. One wants to forgive someone. And that's good for you to, to forgive someone, but only when there's been a recognition on the on the offender. Because that's there's the thing. Wrong. If you're going to apologise, whether you're a politician or whoever, you kind of got to mean it. Otherwise, it means nothing. Yeah. And people can spot a fraudulent apology. When David Cameron apologised for Bloody Sunday, yes. I mean that. I think we can hopefully all agree was actually quite heartfelt. Mm. And and Republicans in Northern Ireland really appreciated that yes. because they could see that it, it that he did mean it. And otherwise, what's the point of doing it? And we also saw that in South Africa when they set up the commission under Bush, yeah. which Tutu, right? There was an actual recognition that we did something wrong. But it was and truth and reconciliation. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, right, Martin, I think that was a really good question. We, we want more like that. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to Tony in Enniskillen in Northern Ireland. Um, Tony, very good evening. What's your question, please? Good evening to yourself and the panel. Um, there was an article today, I think it was today, from Tobias Howard asking to reverse... Um, certain aspects of Brexit, Brexit, notably the single market. Could I ask yourself here on the panel, if we did reverse Brexit, what Brexit borders would you miss? <laughs> Luckily, I'm the host, so I don't have to answer that one. Um, uh, yeah, you're right, Tobias Elwood has said that uh, Britain should rejoin the single market, which if he wants to stand for Tory leader, I think it's a pretty basic mistake to make. But there we go. Um, Onka, let's start with you. Well, uh, I, I think I stood to the fact that, that we, we, I wasn't for Brexit in the, in the, in the beginning. I, I voted to, to remain inside the European Union. And, and I think the, the, the thing that I would miss is that, 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 um, that I, I actually would, would welcome us joining it back again. But that's not part, party policy anyway. We accept that it's been done. But if, if, it, if the choice was there, I'd be keen to join again because I really find travelling in Europe, right, difficult now and having to go for visas. You don't have to have a visa. No, 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 to stay there, I have to work there. More than 90 days. To work, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I meant to work there. Yeah. I can go this far. Is, is well. there any, any positive aspect of Brexit that you can identify that you might miss? That's really what Tony wants to know. Yeah, uh, and the answer is no. OK, Claire? I would miss all of the discussions that we all have about Brexit <laughs> because largely that has taken up my entire life since 2016. Um, you, you voted for Brexit. I did vote for Brexit. I campaigned for Brexit. Um, I'm very happy with the result and would vote the same way again. I think that Tobias Elwood is misjudging that comment by saying go back into the single market. It's not going to happen. And we need to leave this subject alone because I think it has caused more division in this country than anything else. So let's just step away from the conversation. Brexit has happened. It is going to please nobody. If you're a Brexiteer of a certain persuasion, it is Brexit in name only that we've got currently. If you're a Remainer, you didn't want it anyway. So it's pleasing no one. But you can't identify a Brexit bonus that you would miss? I mean, it's very difficult because the pandemic has taken two years away. We haven't seen the possibilities that we could have had with Brexit yet. 
I think that the trade deals we've got coming along are going to be particularly good. Well, if Liz Truss is to be believed. And that I think we need to wait for. I think a lot of it's been hidden under the pandemic. We haven't seen the real benefits of it at the moment. But what benefit do you think would have emerged had the pandemic not existed? Well, it would have been all of the trade deals. That would have been easier. I suspect that the borders may have been held, um, dealt with differently if the pandemic hadn't come along, I would hope. I think that they're handling that particular side of it very, very badly. But I also just like the sovereignty of my nation and not being told by Brussels that I can have a weak hoover. But the question is that if we didn't have the pandemic, do you think we would have resolved the Northern Ireland issue? No, I don't, because I don't think anybody, when Brexit was first thought of, nobody understood well enough what would happen to Northern Ireland. Nobody... Whoops! And we thought it was already. ready. What do you mean, oven... At well, least well, I admit it. it At was... least I can sit here and say, do you know what? I didn't consider that. I know. I'm just saying, whoops, because it's a pretty dire yeah. And I think a lot more people need with. to admit that they didn't quite understand, and we That's do fun. need to find a way around it. Owen. Well, I was a Eurosceptic for Remain, which annoys people, but lots of people voted Remain on balance. I was one of them. Um, just, you know, and I think Brexit, particularly the form it's been enacted, has not been good for the country, I think will be economically poor as a consequence. In terms of the critique that I would have of the European Union, which I expressed, I coined the word Lexit, which is the idea of having a, a left-wing exit from the European Union. That's my only contribution to the English language. That's humiliating for everyone involved. <laughs> um is, uh, I think, state aid, um, that it's easier for national governments outside of the European Union um, to be able to use the state to intervene and support certain industries strategically in a way that would fall foul of competition arrangements within the European Union. There's question marks over how you bring certain public services into full public ownership, um, for example, Royal Mail, um, because of the enforced competition rules within the European Union. So I suppose that, but, you know, I think there were ways around that, potentially. Uh, the argument always was that within the European Union, um, as difficult as that was, obviously lots of European governments do have publicly run services. It just makes it more complicated. Um, but yeah, on balance, I think the form of Brexit we've had from Northern Ireland to the, you know, it was supposed to free us of red tape, but actually it's bound businesses up in all sorts of, you know, red tape, the queues at the ports. I think it's been pretty disastrous, to be honest with you, for the country and the pandemic's papered over how disastrous it's been. But if I was going to really be pushed, I'd say stay aid. Uh, Yasmin, you might be grateful that I'm going to ask you to be brief on this. Oh, sorry, I babbled anyway. Oh, no, it's fine. Uh, well, I was going to say, this is rather selfish, but uh, the one thing I would miss is that prior to Brexit, when my British partner and I would travel to Europe, we'd have to go through different queues, and he'd go through much faster having the European Union passport, so I'd be waiting on the side. Petty. Now, he has to wait with me, so I would miss that. I love pettiness. Right. Um, Tony, thank you very much for that. Uh, let's have our final text question from Margaret in Kensington, who says, it is is, according to Keir Starmer, our patriotic duty to celebrate Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee. So how will the panel be doing so? Bonus points if they make the lemon trifle. <laughs> um, Claire, are you having a street party in Seven Oaks? Not having a street party in Seven Oaks. I'm actually coming up to London with my best friend Kate tomorrow and our boys uh, to come and stand along the Mall and wave flags and just generally look at how beautiful the uh, Jubilee is. You obviously hope to see the Queen, because she's apparently going to appear twice on the balcony. She is, and we're going to try and make sure... That we're coming up here at a ridiculously early hour to make sure that we have uh, a good standing space. Yasmin. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I'm just going to be thinking about the Queen. You know, I, I, to be honest, I was just going to try to enjoy leisurely weather in London and sort of take in all the jubilee. It would be my first... Um, time seeing all that so I also um, <laughs> I kind of related um, I have to study uh, for the life in the UK test should I want to get permanent residency here at some point so I may try to learn a bit more about this country's fine history and invariably that will involve a lot of the Queen I think all you so need long. to do on that is say I was outside Buck Buckingham Palace watching the Queen on the balcony what more do you want <laughs> if you're hearing this pretty Patel it really is that simple <laughs> we should react to that <laughs> Owen uh, it's our patriotic duty to live and uh, defend a free and democratic country where we choose to do what we want, to wish each other well in all the things that we decide freely to do with our time. I wish the Queen well. I wish the people wishing it what on well. What are you going well. to be doing? Um, having a picnic to celebrate my friend's birthday in a park. Um, right. I'm not. Yeah, I'll have a lovely time and everyone else will have a lovely time with their bunting and all the rest of it. Um, treat yourself, have fun, enjoy the weather. It's picking up a bit. 
Um, but I, it's obviously not a patriotic duty to do anything, and it's a ludicrous thing to suggest it is. Anka. Well, I look look forward to joining some of the celebrations in my constituency, lighting of a beacon in in, 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 in Greenford. I'll be then attending street parties and also be, being at the, at, the, at the Royal Pageant on the 5th of, of June. So you're sort of in official role, I suppose. I take it that my role is to represent my constituents. My constituents are celebrating the 70 years of platinum and I'll be joining in those celebrations. Okay. So no, no lemon trifles then for any of us. I obviously. love a lemon trifle. I love it. Well, I yeah, if somebody wants to kick my habit. Obviously not, Ian. Look at me. I can barely tie my shoelaces in the morning. <laughs> Right, thank you very much indeed to all four of you, Owen Jones, Yasmin Sohan, Claire Pearsall and Anka Sahota. In the next hour, I want to hear what you think about the sentence that's been passed down, not to Johnny Depp, although we will have more on that. Sorry, Amber Heard. It's not a sentence, is it? Because they've no, just got to, they, they, they've got to sort of exchange money in some way. But Kurt Zuma, the West Ham footballer, has been sentenced to 180 days community service for kicking his cat. Now, I don't know what the maximum sentence could have been, but I'd have liked to have fined him a million pounds and that could have been given to cat charities or yeah. something. I think it's a very lenient sentence. It doesn't send out the right signal. Or do you think it's wrong to treat celebrities differently? It's wrong for a judge to say, well, I'm going to make an example of you. Should they get the same sentences as anybody else? 0345 6060 973. You're listening to Ian Dale on LBC. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player... And Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock. Johnny Depp has won his multi-million dollar US lawsuit against his ex-wife Amber Heard. A jury ruled an article Miss Heard wrote in the Washington Post in 2018 was defamatory. Mr. Depp's claim against Ms. Heard. As to the statement appearing in the online op-ed entitled 